Good evening and welcome to Joy News at 8 with me, Kemini Nyamani. I'm Anna here are the headlines. The IEA vice presidential debate comes up tomorrow. What are the preparations? What are the rules that will characterize this event? We'll be finding out live as we cross over to Takrade to talk to our correspondents. Now, human rights cause a dance case involving the Electoral Commission and the National Democratic Party to November 16. In business, Pania Food Canary recalls almost 1,800 workers after water supply was restored over the weekend. In entertainment, cross-genre alternative art and music events, Bless the Mic, Arts and Music Festival takes off at the Alliance Princess here in Accra. And on the foreign front, tomorrow is the big day for Americans and U.S. presidential rivals Barack Obama and Mitt Romney face the final springs across swing states for undecided voters. Stay on for details of these stories and many more to come. Your election headquarters on TV, radio and online. Election Headquarters, supported by Star Ghana and Infobox. Now the people of the Volta region have over the years been loyalists to ex-president Rollins and the National Democratic Congress. In some constituencies in this region, the ruling party, NDC, is able to pull almost 95% of both presidential and parliamentary votes cast. So why has the Volta region remained loyal to the NDC? And what do the residents make of the relationship between ex-president Rollins and the NDC? Sairam Abla de Souza has some answers. Walk through the streets of Kata and Ketu South constituencies and you would wonder if the National Democratic Congress, NDC, is the only political party contesting the parliamentary and presidential elections there. In the Anglo constituency, however, posters and signboards of the NPP and PPP candidates could be seen, though not much. This constituency, during the last election, gave the NDC candidate, Clement Kofi Homado, about 97% of the total votes cast. In my quest to find out why most people from the Volta region are loyal to the NDC, the history dated back to the days of Lieutenant General Emmanuel Kwesi Kotoka, who died on the 17th of April, 1967. The incumbent MP for the Yangla constituency narrates what happened. When Kutuka, you know, at the insistence of the accounts, particularly Afrifa, you know, Kutuka was then in charge of the uh, army in the Kumasi. So, you know, he was influenced to overthrow Kwame Nkrumah. But after the overthrow, you know what happened. They turned around and uh, got him out. Not only out, but out and out, you know. So these are things that our people have not been too happy about. Then our own man came on the scene, which is Jerry John Rollins. And so we thought that you know, he was a, ma a man, he was going to defend us. So we supported him. And uh, during his reign, there were quite some major infrastructural development projects. You will not be wrong to say the ex-president Rollins has over the years been idolized by the people of the Volta region. With the exit of his wife, Nana Kunedu Ajiman Rollins, from the NDC and the open support she has received from Mr. Rollins, I asked some chiefs what they think of Rollins now that his heart is divided between the NDC and the NDP. I gathered even if the party and its founder are on separate sides of the political divide, 
or better put, no matter what happens, most people from the Volta region will remain loyal to the NDC and also to ex-president Rawlings. To be frank, we still recognize all that we have done for the, uh, the region and the nation as a whole. So we still recognize him. And uh, even though he's no more in the party, uh, we know his importance. So anywhere that he comes, we, we do uh, admit or cheer him up for all that he has been done for the party. Like at the former day, I'm going to go to the 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 as Volterians, you know where your mother comes from, you must follow them, the, the footstep of your mother, so we are still with them. I just don't want to go far, because uh, development like this comes in bits. So, probably, if they are returned to power, they can do something better than what they've done. From the look of things, majority of people from the Volta region will never change their choice of political party, NDC and political idol, Jerry John Rollins. Well, on the other hand, the Human Rights Court has adjourned to November 16. The case involving the Electoral Commission and the National Democratic Party. Let's follow the request made by counsel for the NDP, Stanley Yaholu, to amend the earlier rate of summons brought in court. The new motion is seeking the Electoral Commission to explain why it opened nominations for the presidential elections for only two days when it had no constitutional backing. In court today for proceedings was the flag bearer of the National Democratic Party, Nanakune Duwajiman Rawlings, and party chairman, Dr. Niyama Jusa Ayer. According to lawyer for the plaintiff, Stanley Aholu, the public elections regulation states the Electoral Commission can only set aside one day to receive the nominations of presidential candidates. Thus, failure to adhere to this provision was a smack on the law. The NDP had earlier filed a writ at the Human Rights Court to compel the EC to allow its flag bearer, Nanakune Duajiman Rawlings, to contest the December election. Later in an interview, counsel for the National Democratic Party, Stanley Aholu, was confident the court will hear his client's case and rule in their favor. We, we came to the court for leave to amend our originating motion. Uh, you know, we need to get leave of the court in order to do so. So we came to the court to, to, to obtain that leave, and the court graciously granted us that leave. So we are going back to amend our originating motion for judicial review, and we're going to serve that hopefully today, and then the case will proceed on the basis of the amendment to the originating motion. We have added significant portions to our case. And when I say significant, we are seeking reliefs by way of quo warranto, mandamus and some declaratory relief. A quo warranto is to, is to ask the question on what authority did the EC act the way it did and so that's what we and we want the court to order them to answer the question. Chairman of the NDP Dr. Niyama Jusa Aye expressed his dissatisfaction with the actions of the Electoral Commission failing to register Nanakune Duwajiman Rawlings to contest the December polls. He was however optimistic the new motion filed in court will rule in their favor. Electoral commissioner is not, it doesn't have an unfettered right to set aside seven days, two days, six days, or whatever. He sets aside days according to the regulations under which he acts. And those regulations say he has only one day. The only one day should be set aside for, for nominations. So who authorizes him? What given the right to set aside two days? So that is gross illegality. And I think Ghanaian should be very interested in this. Why should the electoral commissioner, when a rule say, must, he has only one day for nomination, decide of his own free will that I'm giving you two days for nomination. That's wrong. So something very wrong has occurred. Okay. And not only that, but the various things that we've also articulated regarding what they've done to us are also wrong. That's why we come to the Human Rights Court. Still in court, the appeals court has thrown out an application brought forward by the leader and founder of the New Vision Party, 
Prophet Daniel in cancer, seeking the court to place an injunction on the December polls. According to the trial judge, the cost implication of placing an injunction on the December polls was too high and could lead to constitutional breach compared to refusing the new vision party from contesting the December polls. Staying with the Electoral Commission, the Commission will tomorrow meet with 2012 presidential candidates to dialogue on issues relating to the 2012 elections as well as listen to grievances and concerns of the candidates. Um, tomorrow's program is a collaboration, uh, collaboration between the Electoral Commission, DFID, and then facilitated by CAP Governance Consult. And it is meant to um, create some kind of dialogue uh, between the presidential candidates and the electoral commission on the 2012 December elections, particularly um, issues, major issues con concerning the candidates would be dealt with. We're coming down to their level to talk about pertinent issues regarding their candidature in relation to the 2012 December polls. The second in the series of debates organized by the Institute of Economic Affairs comes off tomorrow at the Akroma Plaza Hotel in Takrodi. This particular debate will be for the vice presidential candidate of the four parties with representation in parliament. The debate will be among certain president, vice president Kwesi Emisa Asa for the National Democratic Congress. Charita Sapon for the Convention People's Party, Helen Senorita Matrevi for the People's National Convention, and Dr. Mahamadou Baumia for the New Patriotic Party. The debate will offer the platform for the candidates to respond to questions on various aspects of the nation's development process and also point out weaknesses in the policies and programs of their co-contestants and present alternatives. According to the IEA, the vice presidential debate will be based on questions received from the public which will cover the following areas, the economy, national development plan, job creation, unemployment, economic growth, as well as national debt. Now, later on, we'll be joined by a research officer at the IEA, Ras for example, to take us through the, the process tomorrow to explain issues to us as far as preparations are concerned. And like I told you earlier, we will cross over live to Takrade to see how far preparations have gone as my, my colleague, uh, Gipti Ando Api, is on standby. In the meantime, we have policy analyst Atik Mohammed on uh, the telephone line. He joins us to uh, give us insight into what his expectations are tomorrow. Good evening, sir. Good evening, my dear. Uh, thanks for joining us. Well. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us on Joy News at 8. Now, what do you expect from tomorrow's debate? Thank you very much. What I expect tomorrow is a very exciting encounter amongst the, pres the vice presidential candidates. I expect to see a great display of understanding of the issues. I expect to see how they are able to complement their various presidential candidates. In respect of, you know, the very policies they are presenting to Ghanaians getting into this election. And for me, I expect to also see a very excited or a very exciting debate amongst them. The last one we had, which was with the presidential candidates, even though some of the presidential candidates were able to respond to the questions that were posed to them. But I think the debating bit of the entire exercise was missing. And I hope to see that happen tomorrow. I would want to see, especially you know, um, the various vice presidential candidates begin to question the viability, the rationale, the relevance, and, and, and the necessity of the various policies their colleagues will be putting across. That is the only way we can get to appreciate the alternatives they are presenting. But if it's just a question and answer session, it, it erupts us of the opportunity to clearly appreciate which alternative is better, which one is achievable, which one is doable, and which one should, should excite our confidence or should merit our support. So for me, I expect to see people questioning uh, the policies of their opponents or, or of their colleagues tomorrow so that we can have a better understanding of what really they, they want to bring on board by way of alternatives. And for me, I expect to also see 
a much more intellectually stimulating exercise tomorrow, whereby people can take on their colleagues on, on the very issues they are presenting on intellectual grounds. So that at the end of the day, whoever is going to make a decision based on what happens tomorrow will be able to make it on the basis of information and conviction that indeed the decision that I made was based on full satisfaction of the presentation the vice presidential candidate made. So for me, I have quite a, a great deal of expectation tomorrow. And I just hope the vice presidential candidates will be able to meet that. Right. Now, learning from the Tamale debate, what would you rather is done differently with the Takradi debate as, as far as organization is concerned? Firstly, what I would suggest to the IEA, you know, improvising this one or moving forward, is that the number of the, the, the period, the timing for uh, the various candidates to respond to questions, in my considered opinion, was rather short. And it, it, it prevented some of the candidates from fully expressing their opinions on certain subject matters. So I'd expect that the timing is extended a little bit. And the number of rebuttals, for me, it, 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 I think it partly contributed to why we didn't have that debating bit of the entire exercise. Because if you have only three rebuttals throughout the, the exercise, you are constrained as to how you are going to utilize or optimize those rebuttal opportunities. But if you make it open, that everybody would have at least one minute to rebut if, if there is a the need to do so after every question. That way it becomes easier. Every Anybody who has issues with what the opponent has raised will be able to do so. But if you make it so straight-jacketed, so limiting, the person is looking at, you know, other options. What would happen if I try to exhaust all my opportunities and other issues come that merit my, my rebuttal and I don't have the opportunity anymore? What is going to happen? So the person is, is not so free as to how to exercise those options of rebuttals. So for me, I think that the rebuttals should be more flexible and there should be more of those opportunities. That way we can get to see how people will question, you know, the, the policies of their colleagues and so on. So the timing is one, the opportunity at rebuttals is two, and maybe I think the number of politicians who are invited to this program, in my you know, express opinion, should be limited. That way, you don't have people coming to cheer on their candidates, and at the end of the day, you abstract the opportunity to do, make any fair and, and, and objective analysis of the performance of the, various, of the various candidates. Because if your candidate performs, whether rightly or wrongly, and you chair, I mean, people will find it very difficult to do their own analysis. But if it's, it's, it's an exercise that is, even though I, I would encourage political participation, but it should not be excessive so that we don't have some of these uh, unnecessary interventions by politicians as the debate proceeds. So right. these are the three recommendations I would want the IEA to consider moving forward right. and, and with the intention of making sure that this one becomes much better than the presidential one. Right. Now, call it the battle of the sexes. Uh, candidly, who do you think is the strongest contender? Um... Professionally speaking, I cannot make such a prediction until, you know, one thing about debate is that you are just based on your performance on the day. So for me, I would be a soothsayer, and I'm not sure I'm a good one at that, to be able to predict who is going to be a stronger candidate on the day. All will depend on your rehearsals as a candidate. All will depend on how well you are able to grasp the issues of your party by which, which you are presenting mm. as alternative policies to the people of this country. So how well you are able to articulate these policies on the day, in my opinion, will make you the best. But until that is done, and how, able you are, um, and how strongly you are able to uh, critique those of your opponents in a way that makes your alternatives the best, for me, will make you the better man or the better woman on the day. But until such is done, I will only be, be, be guessing, which I'm not sure is, is, is good for, for, for this exercise as to who is going to be the stronger man or who is going to be the stronger woman. So I will twiddle my thumbs and wait for what happens tomorrow. Right. Because, and I, like I said, I, I expect to see a very exciting debate tomorrow. So right. maybe after the debate, we'll be able to do the analysis of who really had the day, who was able to respond quite fairly to the questions and so on and so forth. Right. Thank you very much, Atik. Atik Mohammed is a policy analyst. Now, expectations are high of any government that comes into power after the December polls. We spoke to some traders at the Kanishi market here in Accra.
Your election headquarters on TV, radio, and online. Election headquarters supported by Star Ghana and Infobox. Welcome back. President John Mahama has cut sword for work to begin on the construction of a 161 kilovolts transmission line project for Tumuhan and Wa. Now, this will close the northern loop of Techiman, Tamale, Bogatanga, Tumu, Uwa, and Sola. The project is expected to improve upon system performance. Now, according to engineers, this will also enhance the reliability of supply to of power supply to the northern parts of Ghana. The $75 million project is funded by Societe General and Gridco. The project, the project is expected to improve upon system performance. According to engineers, this will also enhance the reliability of power supply to the northern parts of Ghana. The $75 million project is funded by Societe Generale and Gridco. President Mahama says the project goes to confirm his government's determination to make Ghana net exporter of power. Investment in transmission to be able to evacuate that power. And that is what this NDC government has been doing over the last four years. Over the last four years, we've invested almost $400 million in improving the transmission network. Still on the president's campaign tour, President Mahama has assured the people of the Upper West region that when voted into power, he will see to the construction of roads in all corners of the Upper West region. Next major development focus in the Upper West region during the next term of office of the NDC government is to increase the number of kilometers. Chiefs in the various communities continued to openly declare their support for the president and his party, promising to do their best to ensure the party remains in power. Presidential correspondent Seth Kwame Boating filed this report. So tomorrow, November 6th, the second in the series of debates of the Institute of Economic Affairs comes off tomorrow comes off at the Akroma Hotel in Takrade. Now this particular debate will be for the vice presidential candidates of the four parties with representation in Parliament. Like I promised you earlier, we will be crossing over to the venue of the debate live in Takrade where my colleague Giftiando Apia is standing by with some wonderful images. Hello Gifty. Well, you're still watching Joy News at 8, and uh, we're having a bit of a delay feed, and so it takes time, a few seconds, for my colleague well, to hear me from Takrade. But sure. We're here at the Akoma Plaza in Takrade. Right. Gifty. If, if you can hear me. Take us, take us through some of the preparations going on at the Akroma Plaza Hotel in Takarade. Yes, Kevin. E.
Kwai Kemeni, uh, as I also was saying earlier, we are here at the Akoma Plaza in Taitakwadi. Just like we did in Tamale for the presidential debates, this time around we're doing it for the vice presidential candidates. And as you all know, it is the IEA debates, IEA vice presidential debates here. And if you want to see what's going on here, I will have a media coordinator talking to us about preparations, what's going to happen. But then, if you look, if you can see what's at the back, at where I'm standing, you can see that it's going to take, the setup is quite similar to that of the presidential debates. We have, we have the four platforms that have been mounted for each of them. This time we're going to see two males, two females competing, competing uh, for your vote, competing for your vote as an electorate, telling us about their mission. Now, this is the opportunity given them so that they will punch holes into each or one another's vision and try and bring us what they think uh, is much appropriate as they punch holes in those ones. So as, as I told you earlier, we have a media coordinator who, who will be talking to us, giving us the nitty gritties of what we need to know. And when we have them, I'll let you know. Now, it, is it such a big deal like it, it, it was with the presidential debate in Tamale? Well, if I heard you right, you want to find out if it's going to be the same as what happened in Tamale. I assume because I'm not part of the organizers, I assume that it is going to be, it, it, the format is going to be like what we had in Tamale. Because the setup here is quite similar and I don't expect much difference. We don't know if perhaps the producer, if the producers, uh, if the organizers found anything that they would like to improve upon and if they're doing that now, but I assume that it would be the same format. It was when it comes to the atmosphere in Takrade now, is, is it, do you, do you feel as though it's such a big deal like the presidential debate itself was? Well, I, I, I can't say it's a big deal because I have not been here before and after. I have been here now. And what I saw in town, uh, I won't say it's any so much of an enthusiastic atmosphere, enthusiastic feeling. But, but I can say that uh, the people are expectant. I went into the hotel around here and I saw most of the employees gathered around the television looking at the news and watching what's going to happen. Of course, Takradi is in the news and Takradi is a big deal now as far as politics is con concerned. So I saw people gathered around their television, but we had to talk to them, really, to find out how enthusiastic, how expectant they are about this vice presidential debate. Themselves. Uh, have their game plan changed since the Tamale event? It's rather, it's, uh, I may not be able to give you, uh, an, uh, let's say, an authentic uh, 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 provision, but what I'm going to tell you is obviously my opinion. I, I don't know, but at, in Tamale, we didn't see, we didn't get electorates, we didn't get mem uh, people in the auditorium talking to the uh, presidential candidate. I don't expect that that will change. I expect that it will take the very same format. I also believe that the problems that we had with the timer in Tamale will be sorted now. I mean, it, it, it was obvious they, they were having the timer. The timer was giving them problems, and I assume that that has been fixed. And so we don't expect to see that now. We expect to see questions from the moderators, just like we saw right. in Tamale, and they will have the vice presidential candidate uh, respond. Now, this time around, though, it's going to be between two economists. It's going to be between 
you know the vice president is an economist. You know the vice presidential candidate for the MPP is an economist. We're going to see, well, well they probably will be talking most uh, more about, it, about the economy because that, f when it comes to that area, they are Really, it is the affair. And then we'll be having two females, I'm sure, two females who are new to this race. We're going to find out. That excites me, though, because we're having females contesting, females competing among themselves healthily, of course. Right. Uh, those are pictures live from Takra, the Akroma Plaza Hotel. And I was in an interaction with my colleague, Gifty Ando Apia. Moving on to some other stories. Six persons, including a six-year-old girl, narrowly escaped death after an Isuzu Rodeo crashed into a boutique on Monday morning. Etonam Se was at the scene and has filed this report. Residents of Mataiko in Accra woke up to an unusual scene Monday morning. This Isuzu Rodeo car with registration number GS4907 ran into this boutique full of clothes and other wares. Before that, it had crashed into this Niza Premier taxi with registration number GE878W. The Isuzu Rodeo was reportedly on top speed from Dan Suman. The shop owner counts her lots. I have clothes, laces, shoes, bags, cosmetics. This is a, a lot. All oh, I can't pick anything from there right now. Eyewitnesses share their stories. The car was coming from Dansuma area towards the traffic light, and there was a taxi driver. I don't know whether the taxi driver intercepts the Pajero driver, but there was a collision around. So the driver lost control because of the impact. You know, after the impact, he lost control. So I was just standing in front of where the accident occurred. All of a sudden, I saw the car flying to my end. So I just jump over, and then the car ent enter into the store. Yeah, they were here, and I'm gonna yeah, yeah, jump on thing. You know, say can't see inside, you know. Hey, yeah, found how the top speed ever. So now that taxi is so on. I done it now. Hey, on all things, say in a air cost one. See, in one second, I can't see him, but now taxi is so many kind. And a taxi is shifting by the right side, you know. Until you want to say, can if it's one of an up or taxi, but when you see a control, no, and what TC has it to that, and a painter for me, no inside to real more. It turns out by and one persons involved in the accident include the driver of the Isuzu Rodeo and his six year old daughter, two shop attendants, one painter, and a customer who was at the time buying. They all sustained several degrees of injuries and were rushed to the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Tonight's Pioneer Food Canary producers of Starkist Tuna and other canned fish products have resumed operations, recalling almost 1,800 workers who were sent home. This was after water supply was restored at its factory over the weekend. The company last week shut down its operations and asked the workers to go home indefinitely. This was as a result of irregular water supply to the firm and others at the free zones and Cleve and Tema. The closure also affected other businesses that provide services to the company. Acting Head of Human Resources Nanayao Amaka Otri told Business Reports the resumption should help the company recover quickly what they have lost over the past few days. He said it means they have to work around the clock to meet orders before the Christmas break. He also mentioned that measures were being put in place to ensure that such a situation doesn't affect the operations badly. The company was said to be losing some $100,000 daily as a result of the shutdown. 
Uh, Pioneer Food Canary also produces, produces the popular John West tuna for the European market and British retailer Max and Spencer. Now, the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority has suspended the recent hikes in storage charges at the ports. The authority, in this bid to reduce overcrowding at the ports, reviewed the number of days for storage from 7 to 4 and increased charges by 100%. The move did not go down well with businesses and the Association of Ghana Industries, which argued the increase will only worsen the high cost of doing business in the country. Kumi Ajay Sam, the marketing and corporate affairs manager of Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, told Business Report they consulted widely before deciding to suspend the hikes for now. Sam also denied claims that the move was just meant to rake in more revenue instead of decongest the port. In foreign business, HSBC Bank has put aside a further $800 million to cover potential money laundering fines in the United States. The bank had already put aside $700 million after a U.S. Senate report published in July said a lax controls had left it vulnerable to money laundering. Hello there, my name is Rashida Kadiri and I have the latest in the world of sports. Now, Hartsafok Administrative Manager Ashford Teteoku has been forced to resign from the club after persistent pressure from board chairman Togwe Afere the 14th. Information reaching Joy Sports reveals that Teteoku has come under in persistent accusations of aiding sack coach CK Akono to recruit unqualified players for the club as well as paying some staff members on Julie. Remember, these are only allegations. Joyce Force will bring you details of this particular story in our subsequent bulletins. Now, away from that, let's talk politics. Tomorrow will be the big IEA debates for the four vice presidential candidates of the NDC, the NPP, the CPP, and the PNC. On Saturday, we tasked some of these uh, political parties to tell us or to spell out clearly their vision for sports should they be elected into power on December 7. Now, we start our series with the presidential candidate, all the NPP, who are also vying for um, the presidential candidate. So they were represented by former Education and Sports Minister, Honorable Obi Amwa, who also happens to be the member of parliament for... Um, for a breed in Sawam. He was telling us that the NPP's vision mainly is to pass a sports bill into law and set up a sports fund. Uh, we are governed by SMC, the 54, That's 1976. Good. Yes. We felt that that law was outmoded. We should bring in a new law. So we had a comprehensive program to bring in a sports law. We even have to travel abroad, bring in consultants, etc., etc. And that has retarded our progress to the extent that if we don't think seriously about funding for sports, then all that we are seeing will be a joke. I mean, we need a dedicated source of funding. And we thought that passing the sports bill where we have created that sports fund could go a long way in ensuring that at least when it comes to this headache of um, looking for money for even competitions, it would be a thing of the past. And if we be able to do it under the GEF fund, why not uh, under a sports fund? So hopefully tomorrow you will be hearing from the People's National Convention. You'll also be hearing from the Progressive People's Party and, of course, the People's National Convention. We have all of these coming up and more. But uh, back to the Joy Sports Invitational Tournament that was held some couple of weeks back. It failed to produce a winner for the men's football category because light was not on our side. So this Saturday at the Elwak Sports Stadium, there's an opportunity for finalists Zoom Lion, Global Access and Ghana commercial bank to pit their strengths against one another now uh, they again will uh, be engaging in the war of words so let's hear first from zoom lion
Yes, there's so much energy and enthusiasm on camp. We've pitched camp here since the last week. We were semi-finalists in the last competition. And this time around, we're not giving up. We're not giving any stone on 10. We're not just coming to participate. We're coming to make one nest. And definitely, I can promise you, we're coming home with a trophy. And as you can see, we're just coming from the company. We've come for like uh, two weeks now, just because of this program. As you can see, we are very much prepared to face whoever is coming. Right, so yesterday, eight matches took place across eight league centers in the country in the Globe Premier League Week 6 fixtures. Now, results were a bit surprising. Some results were a bit surprising. Accra had to folk happened to record their win, their second win after six matches in the Globe Premier League, beating RTU by three goals to two under caretaker coach Ben Ajay. Temer Youth held Brooklyn Chelsea to a 1 1 draw. Nua Dibiase, they happened to find a magic one by beating Wild All Stars by one goal to nil. Hearts of Lions stayed home to be beaten by a goal to nil against Ashfield. Adriana Stars, too, and Medell's professionals nil. Brecum Arsenal's also lost at home to Liberty Professionals by a goal to nil. Mediama SC could not continue their fine form, losing at the Takwa and Aboso Park by a goal to nil as against defending league champions Kumase Asante Kotoko. King Faisal also lost at the Babayara Sports Stadium by a goal to nil against Ebu Swat Dwarfs. So with these results, we'll check out who is lying on which part of the table. Coming up uh, pretty shortly, standings of the Glow Premier League table. So it's still Mediama SC who are on top of the table with uh, um, 13 points. Ash Gold have jumped to second place with 12 points. Brekum Arsenal, they are third with 11 points. Kotoko have jumped to the top four. They are fourth on the table with 10 points. Liberty, Temer Youth, Adriana Stars, Ebusa Dubs, they follow in that particular order. And then that's the first half of the table. We'll go to the second half of the table. Uh, and then we see the likes of RTU, who are Brekum Arsenal, who are lying there at the bottom of the table. We just hope that uh, probably the, with six matches gone down, there are 24 matches more to go. So we'll see if there will be more um, surprises coming up in the Glow Premier League. And that will end it for the sports segment for tonight. Coming up next, international news. Stay tuned.